seeing you behind the scenes.
Good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Ross, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm Oceana's Mid-Atlantic campaign organizer, joining you from Washington, DC. It's my absolute pleasure to share with you an inspirational story of change during tonight's Ocean Steward Spotlight with our guest, special guest, sustainability advocate, international speaker, author, TEDx speaker, Politico, and founder of Hannah for Change, Hannah Testa. In a few minutes, we're going to start talking to this awesome human being. But before that, I wanna share with you a little bit about Oceana and our Ocean Steward Spotlight Series. Oceana, founded in 2001, is the largest international advocacy organization focused solely on ocean conservation. Our offices around the world work together to win strategic directed campaigns. We seek to achieve measurable outcomes that will help make our oceans more biodiverse and abundant. The purpose of the Ocean Steward Spotlight Series is to recognize the people who are broadening the conservation movement. The series is a commitment to all our partners in the conservation community who make our collective success possible. Before we start the interview, I want to pause and acknowledge the importance of Black History Month and direct you to freedommosaic.com where you can watch a one minute interview with civil rights legend, Reverend C.T. Vivian. In this interview, Reverend C.T. Vivian describes his experiences with racial discrimination, including the barring of blacks from beaches and oceans and his use of weigh-ins for civil rights. I hope you'll watch the short video at freedommosaic.com. I wanna thank coastal advocate, Hermina Glasshill, who we talked to last week for sharing the video and the associated Freedom Mosaic project with us. Now, let me introduce Hannah. Hannah is an 18 year old student from Cumming, Georgia. She is passionate about the issues that affect our planet. And she has been using her voice since a young age to educate others because she believes that knowledge is power. As a sustainability advocate, Hannah partners with businesses and government to maximize their sustainability commitments. Hannah has received numerous honors, including the CNN Teen Earth Day Hero, the Captain Planet Young Superhero for Earth Award, the Action for Nature International Young Eco Hero Award, the Gloria Barron Prize, and others. We are so grateful to Hannah for making the time to join us and share her message of empowerment and action. So let's dive right into getting to know you, Hannah. Can you tell us a little bit about the moment you fell in love with the ocean? I will. I first want to thank you so much, Jacob, for having me as being a part of this program. It's such an honor and I'm so excited for this conversation and thank you all for tuning in and listening. So um, to answer your question, I guess, of how I first fell in love with the ocean, I grew up, you know, far away from the ocean. I actually originally grew up in um, the suburbs of Maryland and now I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So I don't live by the coast, surprisingly, as an ocean advocate, you would think I'd be on the beach every day and I would be if I could. Um, but I, the first time I visited the beach, I was around two years old. My parents took me to the beach for the first time. And even though I don't fully remember it, um, I think my parents have constantly told me how they could see the spark in my eye as I was, you know, touching the sand for the first time and being in the ocean and hearing the waves crash. And I, they talk about how important that was and how they could truly see that connection I had with me, nature, even at such a young age. And as I got older, I started to realize how immense that connection was. I truly had such a love and passion for the planet, for spending time outdoors. Um, and part of that also started with having an organic garden in my backyard and it's something that my parents, uh, I was so grateful that, that my parents did that. And I would always spend my weekends and my summers outside in nature. And I realized that many of my classmates and people around my age didn't have that connection to nature. And it was so mind blowing to me that this immense connection I had that most people didn't have. And actually in kindergarten, I did my first I guess speech I've ever done and it was a show and tell on Earth Day about why we celebrate Earth Day, why it's so important to help protect our planet and I think from that moment that was when my parents realized wow she truly cares and ever since then I've been you know speaking up about the planet and why it's so important um, and mainly you know, my passion for the oceans. I love spending time in the ocean. I think it's such a calming and healing place and when I was around the age of 10 that's when I first started learning about the environmental issues that were impacting our planet and our oceans. And it broke my heart uh, to hear that mainly human greed was causing 
these problems that'll ultimately end up in our extinction as well. So I knew that even though I was, you know, just in fifth grade that I had to do something, I had to speak up and not just sit back and watch it happen. So ever since then, I've been doing this for the past eight years. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, like I remember when I was young and I saw the Smoky Mountains for the first time. That was a huge, that was a huge moment for me. And um, I have a young niece, she's about two and a half, and we went to the beach, you know, last time I visited her in Florida. And it's amazing how every time I come back to the ocean, I'm just, I'm just so struck. It's just such a such a place of reflection and beauty. And I'm, you know, um, I imagine what I got from what you said is there's just an emotional connection, you know, to to the earth, but it also has so many consequences for us as a species and, and our society. Um, and so on that, my next question for you, um, Booklist said that your book called Taking on the Plastics Crisis, quote, delivers straightforward advice for getting involved in the global movement to eliminate single use plastics. When did you realize that you could affect change? And what was your most memorable advocacy experience? I think my parents, played a huge role in the person that I am today. And I'm so lucky and so grateful to have such supportive parents. Um, but I think they've always, you know, ingrained in me that I can change the world. I don't think they envisioned I would be doing what I'm doing today. Um, but I think they always ingrained in me that I can have an impact and, you know, teaching me important role models um, from a young age, um, learning about, you know, Malala, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, um, looking up to those people and growing up learning about their stories that they played a pivotal part of the person I am today um, but also learning you know them teaching me about protecting our planet and I grew up you know taking reusable bags to the store and trying to recycle where I could and you know not litter so even you know just the daily things that I was doing at a young age and growing up with definitely had an impact um, about the work that I do but I think also once I started becoming aware of these issues even at a young age and knowing that I had to do something and I couldn't sit back. And even though these were such large issues, I realized that doing something, no matter how small is better than doing nothing. And I also, as you mentioned, you know, I have this mindset that knowledge is power. And back seven, eight years ago, plastic pollution wasn't such a mainstream topic. Most people didn't really know what plastic pollution was um, and that, you know, we are a huge part of the problem as well. So I felt that if we can educate other people and arm people with knowledge, we can educate others and have such a huge impact collectively. So a lot of my focus has been, you know, educating people and, you know, it started off small and smaller, like in my own community, talking with a couple of students or speaking at libraries. And now it's expanded far further than I ever could have imagined. Um, and now I speak to people all over the world. Um, but I think it's, I've, kind of always had that passion in me. I've always been kind of outgoing and outspoken, um, especially from a young age. I went to four different elementary schools. So I was, you know, had to be accustomed to making new friends and um, being out of my own comfort zone. So I think that also played a part in that as well. Um, but I think the second part of your question, um, one of my most memorable experiences, I was able to establish Plastic Pollution Awareness Day in the state of Georgia, which is actually February 15th. Um, so that uh, passed a couple of days ago, but um, I was able to establish that in 2017. And while it was a successful event, we had um, a room in the Capitol. We had around 500 people, you know, walk in and out of the Capitol. We had um, media coverage. It was on like CNN, Weather Channel, and over 300,000 people just in Georgia on the local news saw it. Um, and the whole idea was to educate people about plastic pollution. Um, even though it was such a huge success, I also faced challenges and backlash and um, the plastic lobby didn't want me to have that day. And um, I was 14 at the time and I was already working with the plastic lobby trying to compromise and see how we can still have the day, which is what they didn't want at all. And after you know a lot of discussion and compromising and working um, with one another, seeing how to best make it work, um, we were able to have the day, but one of the things I had to sacrifice and give up was speaking on the Senate floor. And that was a bit disheartening for me because I really wanted to address all the state senators. Um, but fortunately, the following year in 2018, I got that opportunity. And not only was that, I think, so pivotal, um, such a pivotal moment for me, but also I remember, and I actually talk about this in my book, it's the introductory of my book. I was waiting to speak and there's an adult speaking at the podium before me. 
and none of the senators were paying any attention to her. And as an adult, um, you know, and no one's paying attention to her, I was already so distraught that oh, I've worked so hard for this moment. I waited over a year for this moment. And, you know, if they're not listening to adult, are they going to listen to me, you know, a 15, a 15 year old? And I knew that I still, even though I was disheartened, I knew I still had to, you know, speak, speak up and speak from the heart. And so when it came my opportunity and my turn to speak, uh, after a few sentences, there was silence and everyone was watching me and listening to me. And I think that was such a huge moment of even just for me to realize that young people, we hold so much power and our voices have such a huge impact. You know, it's funny um, when I hear you answer that, you know, it makes me think about all of the noise that we hear on social media, a lot about political advocacy. And in my experience, it's been when you step up to the plate and show leadership and, you know, try and accomplish something tangible, people really stop to listen. Would you agree with that? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify for our audience out there, you helped Georgia declare February 15th the official Plastic Pollution Awareness Day. That's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that, <laughs> that was, that's just incredible. Um, so rolling right along here, um, Alyssa Akbar, she's the 18-year-old Florida director of March for Our Lives. And she said um, that her and other student leaders are starting to feel some burnout. So she believes that in order to continue to drive change, quote, it's very much about training the next generation. So my question for you, Hannah, is how do we go beyond this sort of transactional advocacy and really invest in that next generation of leaders? I really love this question because, and I, we were talking about this earlier, because I think activism is such a general term. There's not a set definition of what it is. And I think it's constantly changing. And especially, you know, I've been doing activism for quite a few years, well, for most of my life, it's been eight years. Um, but just seeing how it's even changed in that um, time frame, you know, social media has become such a prevalent part of activism, especially the youth perspective of, of it. Um, but then you also see, you know, people protesting. And so I think activism comes in many different forms and it's been changing over the years. But I think what makes activism um, more than just transactional, but having it sustainable. And by sustainable, I don't mean, you know, what we all think when we're talking about the environment of something protecting the planet, but sustainable where, um, you know, it'll move on even without you and long lasting um, projects that are regenerative. And, we'll, you know, it's kind of your legacy, but it's still gonna move on after afterwards. And I think March for Our Lives is an example. You know, even when those students, you know, do go to college and leave that movement behind, it's still gonna be there. And there's still gonna be other students that carry on that movement. Um, so I think an important part of advocacy and action is having sustainable movements that will keep going and growing over the years. So I think that's super important that it doesn't just stop when, you know, the leaders of that movement stop. It's going to keep finding its path and keep growing and moving. I think that's so important. But I think also to, you know, invest in the next generation, I think we need more youth empowerment. Um, and I think we're definitely seeing that a lot more recently, more youth involvement in activism. But I think even at a young age, we're taught that our voices are invalid. And even, you know, sometimes in school settings that like you have to be quiet and, you know, not ask questions. Um, so I think, you know, inspiring young people that, you know, they can make a difference, not just, you know, when they're older down the line, but even, you know, at the age that they're at, they don't have to wait until, you know, they're old enough to vote or old enough to be in positions of power. They can use their voice or whatever talents that they care about, um, you know, whether it could be film, photography, whether they're better at, you know, writing letters or um, tech savvy and social media, they can use those talents to help better um, to help better protect the planet or um, to focus on any issues they care about. Uh, on the topic of that, uh, leveraging people's interests, um, the cover art on your book is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, what's an example um, of, of some maybe non-traditional kind of advocacy, whether it's through art or whether it's through poetry or maybe some other experience that you or some of your um, colleagues have had uh, in the fight against plastic pollution? Yeah, I think what I love about our generation is that it, it, we are super creative and we've found so many different outlets 
to approach the issues we care about. Um, I'm a huge lover of Amanda Gorman, you know, the inaugural poet. She did an incredible poem last World Oceans Day um, about the ocean, and I love that poem. Uh, so I highly recommend you to check that out. Um, I think it's super, obviously, she's an incredible woman, but I think also that poem is really touching. Um, my friend Shelby O'Neill, um, she wrote a letter to the CEO of Alaska Airlines to get away from single-use single plastic straws. And because of her letter, they were the first airline to do so. Um, just from that one letter, you know, that one message that she sent. Um, but then there's also, you know, youth that get involved in policy. Uh, my friend Dyson Chi played a huge role in the single-use plastics ban in Hawaii. Um, there's also Miladi and Isabel Weijin in Bali, and they, um, st they collected petitions, but they also staged a hunger strike to get the attention of the president of Bali. And now they have a ban on single-use plastic bags in Bali. So there's so many incredible young people that are you know, finding different ways. And there's also um, young activists that also write books as well. I am um, a part of an event called Ocean Heroes Bootcamp. And um, what's the incredible thing about it is it's fostering young people um, all across the world to start campaigns um, to help better protect our planet. And we focus on so many different avenues of how you can do that so that, you know, activism isn't one set in stone thing and using, you know, your talents and best putting your best foot forward into those movements to have an impact. So I've been able to work with kids that do all kinds of things. Some people make artwork. Um, so my friend actually made a, like a dress like Elsa's dress out of plastic. Um, and so it, it's been really, it's been really incredible to watch like how creative um, our generation is becoming. I'm sure my niece would love to wear that plastic dress. <laughs> um, on that, um, th you know, thank you for that answer. That's so many beautiful examples of, of enacting change. Um, how do you think organizations like Oceana that are sort of like legacy organizations that have been around for a while, in your experience, how have, you know, other conservation leaders reached out to you to be more inclusive to youth advocates? I think it's super important that you know, these movements are intergenerational. It's not, you know, one generation or another. And um, especially like when we're talking about upstream solutions like businesses and policy, it's not just the same older generation because a lot of these issues are, you know, impacting the future of young people. And oftentimes we don't have a seat at that table to make our voices heard and to talk about how this directly impacts our future. So I think it is so important, you know, to lend out a hand and to have that seat at that table for young people to talk, but also um, even just to have people on the front lines, people that are directly impacted by these issues, and especially um, communities, even just here in America, are impacted by you know petrochemical facilities and incinerators. They're directly you know facing the impacts of plastic pollution, not just plastic pollution in the ocean, but just the production um, and the burning of plastic here. Um, they see it firsthand. Um, and being able to provide them a voice because a lot of times they don't have the resources, you know, to do the activism work that I do. And I understand it is such a privilege for me, you know, to spend a lot of my time doing this instead of, you know, um, getting a job and helping to provide for my family. Um, and a lot of these communities are, you know, low income communities, communities of color, and oftentimes they don't get to have their voices heard and don't have the resources to make their voices heard. So I think it's also important that we reach out to them and listen to them because they are you know, directly facing the impacts. I couldn't have said it any better. Um, thank you for that. Um, so after we've talk, kind of talked about, you know, youth engagement, I know that one thing that's really important to you is this connection between plastic pollution and climate change. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us um, what this connection is and why it's so important to you? Of course. So plastic, actually 99% of plastic is made from fossil fuels. So the more you know, single-use plastics that we consume and we're actually demanding, um, ha we're having a heavy reliance on fossil fuels because of it. And if we, there's a lot of talk about climate change. And so even the fossil fuel industries are you know, shifting their focus for fracking for energy, but to actually uh, frack to produce plastic because they're seeing that as a more sustainable, meaning like long-term system for them as more people are switching to renewable energy. So as of right now, plastic makes up 5% of oil consumption, but it's predicted that by 2050, it'll increase to 20% of oil production. But even beyond that, every stage of plastic from you know extraction, production, 
transportation, incineration, even just the breaking down of plastics at all, every stage of plastic releases greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide. So it's contributing to the climate crisis um, directly. Um, but I think we often see these two issues as you know, two separate entities, but it's the same institutions that are really upholding these crises. And by, you know, focusing on one of them and being able to find solutions and mainly diverting away from fossil fuels, that'll have a tremendous impact on both issues. So I think they're very much interlinked and connected. And we really need to be able to work together because it's kind of two societies, <laughs> two different activism sectors of climate change and plastic pollution. And there truly is, you know, power and numbers and collaboration and working together and, you know, being able to combine our two worlds and our two passions, I think will have such a tremendous impact on being able to help better protect our planet. So is it safe to say that you're excited to work with more of the traditional climate activist community and this joint effort to address kind of the polluting aspects of plastic? Most definitely, because it's also, again, both issues, you know, impact frontline communities is having an impact, you know, on our oceans, having an impact on our own human health. So at the end of the day, you know, tackling both issues will have an, a huge impact and be an incredible win for all of us. Um, I totally agree. And uh, one of my colleagues um, shared a report with me. It's a um, the Center for International Environmental Law. They recently recently issued a report identifying plastic as a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, which you said um, in their report, um, they find that uh, in 2019, the production and incineration of plastic added more than 850 million metric tons of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, equal to emissions from 189 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants. That's 189 coal-fired power plants. And I have to be honest with you, I'm just now starting to see these um, statistics kind of comparing plastic production to coal-fired power plants. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking. It I'm is. wondering if you're having the same reaction to this. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you know more than I do, but it's just staggering to think of how huge an impact, an impact even larger than the aviation sectors in terms of greenhouse gases. It truly is. And I think another great analogy to talk about with plastic pollution in the ocean is essentially an oil spill, but it's just, you know, plastic items. And it, unless we, you know, find the solutions to stop it at the source, of course, cleanups are important, same with oil and plastic pollution, but it's stopping it from the source to prevent these from happening. <laughs> we, Oceana and you are on the exact same page on all of that. We love talking about the opposition to offshore drilling and tackling plastic pollution. At the <laughs> this is working out perfectly. Um, so now I want to ask you uh, a question uh, for our viewers who want to take action. What would you say um, for those people who love the ocean but don't know what steps they can take? What, what should they do to protect mm -hmm. the ocean? Of course, I always say the first place and the first thing to do is to educate yourself and kind of, you know, dive further into the issue and kind of become a mini expert in this issue. Um, for me, I love watching documentaries. I'm kind of like a film person. So I love watching documentaries because you're putting together, you know, statistics and information, but also visuals as well. Uh, but some people, you know, enjoy reading more um, or going through articles, but find ways to educate yourself. And obviously you want to get them from reliable sources as well, um, especially, you know, going on the internet and social media, you want to make sure they're reliable sources. Um, but of course, educate yourself so that not only are, you know, changing your own habits, but you can also arm yourself with this knowledge to educate other people. Because again, this is truly, you know, power of the people of collaboratively and collectively making an impact. Um, and then, you know, with that knowledge, you know, take action on it. And, you know, there's obviously things we can do in our day-to-day -day lives. We've all heard about, you know, not using plastic straws, bringing reusable bags. And of course that is important, but there's also more that we can be doing because again, that's kind of the downstream solutions. And we want to focus more on upstream, preventing this from happening in the first place. And I think as individuals, we can sometimes forget how much power we hold as constituents and as consumers. Um, as constituents, of course, voting is so important, but also just reaching out to your representatives. I think we also, and especially for young people, we don't realize that power we hold. Um, and I, at a young age, thought you had to be a politician to get involved or a voting age. I had my first meeting with a state senator when I was 13. 
and I've been, you know, lobbying and testifying. And it's so important, again, to have intergenerational conversations and having young people at the table. But it's so important for anyone, you know, to talk about, you know, the ocean and protecting our planet. So, you know, reaching out to representatives to support bills um, or even just in general to help better protect our planet um, is so important. And even, you know, with businesses, as consumers, we vote with our wallets. You want to support businesses that are doing good and try and stay away from businesses that aren't but also you can reach out to them or even tweet them on social media. That's become a lot more popular. But, you know, as I mentioned, Shelby O'Neill reaching out to Alaska Airlines, that one message had a huge everlasting impact on Alaska Airlines and ultimately led to other airlines following um, Alaska Airlines. So even just simple things like that, because as consumers, you know, we're funding these businesses, we're keeping them afloat. And if we're as consumers telling these businesses what we want them to do, they're ultimately listen. And we've seen, you know, how that's had an impact over the past few years of huge businesses like Starbucks starting to divert away from single-use plastics, um, Kroger, Publix, they're all realizing that we want change and they won't have business if they don't. So it's so important, you know, as consumers, as constituents, that we make our voices heard because we'll have such a huge impact. That's such an incredible answer. And I could ask you 10 more questions just based on <laughs> that, but for the sake of time, I will move on to our next question. Um, Oceana has two major audiences. First, we have supporters who are just getting into their conservation values. And second, we have those who are more experienced. Uh, this question comes from those of us who are experienced in the conservation field. Mm -hmm. What's your vi vision for the ocean, ocean conservation community? How would you like to see the conservation community grow and evolve? I think it always is changing and evolving, which I do love that it's not stagnant. And I started to notice this change, but I would love it to be more prevalent that when we're talking about specifically on plastic pollution, it's more of the waste side of it, plastic already in the ocean. And it's that kind of out of sight, out of mind mentality. And especially I live hours from the nearest coastline. Um, and so everyone in my community, you know, doesn't have that same connection that I do to the oceans. So they don't see it firsthand. They don't really understand the importance of our ocean. And by, you know, stressing the idea of plastic, you know, having an impact on, you know, sea turtles, it doesn't hit home for them as much as, you know, it would for me because I love the ocean. Um, so I think having more of that human aspect and how it's already, you know, impacting us, whether it's human health or talking about, again, the communities, the frontline communities that are impacted here in the U.S., um, I think being able to talk about you know, the, I think health impacts is a huge thing because I think that hits, you know, almost everybody because that impacts us directly. Talking about, you know, we eat five grams of plastic every week. Um, that's about the size of a credit card. I think that's my favorite statistic, not because it's fun to say, but I think it's something that shocks everybody to saying, wow, you know, that directly impacts me. That impacts my family, my friends, um, because of the way that we're living our lives um, and the way that as you know, we live in this consumerism society. So I think, you know, talking about bringing, bringing it more home to people and kind of directing it towards the audience. Because yeah, for communities like where I live, it talking about faraway plastic and, you know, the, the um, Great Pacific Garbage Patch, you know, the Pacific um, Gyre, they don't have that connection. So I think I've seen, I've started to see the shift and I think it is super important, but talking more about, you know, our own health and also the health of other humans. That's a great answer. Um, we at Oceana know that there are several types of plastic that have been uh, well documented to be concerning for health experts mm -hmm. across the spectrum. So, um, yeah, it's. I hope I hope folks will also you know look into that because it is really concerning. Um, well, after speaking with you, Hannah, I'm wondering how many other wonderful ocean stewards are out there. Um, and if our if folks in our audience are watching right now and you'd like to recommend an ocean steward for a future episode, please drop the suggestion in the comments on Facebook. We would love to hear from you. Um, and there's so much more time we could fill speaking with you, Hannah, but our time is coming to an end. Um, we want to ensure uh, today's audience knows how to find your website, where they can learn about you and your book. We're screen sharing your uh, website now. So I hope people will think of this as a resource the next time they're ready to take action or to help our planet. And before we sign off, Hannah, do you have any parting words for the people watching? 
Of course. Well, again, thank you all so much for listening. And again, you can reach out to me at HannahForChange.org. You can find more information about the work that I do and how you can support it. And then there's also the link to my book on that website as well. But just, I think my overall message to everyone listening is to challenge the, challenge the narrative. No matter how young you are, your voice is valid. And don't stay silent in the face of injustice. Speak up, speak out, be loud, be clear, and fight for what is important to you. Because the weight of the world is not as heavy if we all lift it together. Um, thank you so much, Hannah. It was great talking with you. And for everyone else, remember to catch the next Ocean Steward Spotlight on March 4th at 6 p.m. here on Facebook. We will be speaking with Kemet uh, Amon Lewis. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night.